Good morning. You may be seated. Could you turn with me in God's Word to Ephesians chapter 6? We will be continuing in our series on the armor of God, and the sermon in particular will focus on uh, verse 15, the shoes of the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, which is by the Lord's providence very fitting to be speaking about the gospel of peace as we witness baptisms this morning. But instead of just reading the one verse, I'll read the whole passage so that we can um, just know the broader context as well. So from verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is in the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayers and supplications to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Let us pray. O oh God in heaven, we do pray and ask that you would be merciful to your people this Lord's Day morning. Lord, as I proclaim the mystery of this gospel of peace, I ask with Paul that you would give me the right words to say. But more than that, Lord, I ask that you would minister to all of us this morning of these wonderful truths, that your spirit would speak to us through the proclamation of your word. Lord, I pray that you would make us more like Christ. You would make us ready for living in this world and as we go out and live, Lord, we would do as we just sang. Live earnestly as we long for the day when we stand with Christ in glory. Amen. So earlier this year, war broke out in Ukraine, which most of you should know. And since then, as I've been following the war, I've been reading up a bit about European history. Just to understand the geopolitics and how all of these nations um, fit together. And one key event in the formation of many of these, these nations involved now was the fall of the Soviet Union. This is when the Cold War ended between the USSR and the Western nations. The Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc um, weren't at Cold War anymore. But this didn't only bring about the end of the Cold War, it also brought about the formation and the independence of, of many of these former Soviet states into their own little countries. And as time went on, we saw how these new countries developed, and we saw a split in them. See, some of them grew into wealthy, developed nations, countries like Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Others remained relatively poor, maybe not poor by Africa standards, but in the European context, they're considered to be relatively poor in developing countries. These are countries like Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Kazakhstan. And there's one common factor that unites among these developed nations. One thing that they all seem to have in common, the, the ones that did really well, that is. And that is that they were quick to make peace with the West. They quickly joined e the EU. They quickly joined NATO, some of them. And this making of alliances gave them social and economic stability, and they were able to develop. They were able to get ahead of the other countries that weren't in these strong alliances, that, that had more unstable environments. And I'm not telling you this now to be an advocate of NATO or the EU. This isn't about politics, so if you 
are a Russia Times subscriber, don't worry, I'm not here to advocate for those guys. I just want to give an illustration here. In two weeks, I could give an illustration on why these organizations are bad. But what I want to illustrate here is that who a country makes peace with, who they form their alliances with, has consequences. It has an effect on how they develop going forward. And I want to highlight this point because this applies to us spiritually. As we're working through the armor of God, we are reminded, we're reminded by this text here that we are in a battle. We do fight against these spiritual and cosmic powers. The kingdom of darkness is at war with the kingdom of light. And the kingdom that you are at peace with, this is going to have consequences for your life here on earth. It's going to have consequences for your walk going forward. And our text today speaks about the gospel of peace. It's the shoes of the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And so we get some of this peace of who, which side of this battle you're on in this text today. And so as we look at this, we're going to look at it as th under three points. What is the gospel of peace? What is meant by readiness in the text? And what is the significance of the illustration of shoes? So what does Paul mean when he says the gospel of peace? This is where we need to start because we can't understand what the other things are in reference to if we don't fully unpack this term gospel of peace. And many of us here who've been coming to church for ages will know that the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, Paul's calling it the good news of peace. What of peace? Why is this peace significant? You see, peace comes from the gospel. It comes from the good news. We need peace. Okay. The problem man has is a problem of sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, we've broken God's commandments. You may think you're a good person. You may say, look, I strive to lead a good life, but in truth, we cannot do this. You know, I mean, has anybody here never told a lie, never taken something that doesn't belong to them, never coveted and lusted after things that weren't theirs, not satisfied with the things God has given you? That is an affront to Him. And if we're honest, we all know the answer to these things. We have done these things. And we're a church here that preaches sin, so I don't think I need to convince um, those who attend that people are sinners. And the Bible clearly teaches this. You know, and if you're unconvinced, if you're visiting, you can look at the Word of God and it will tell you that all men are sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But I mean, you just need to open up News 24, read some of the news, and the conclusion is inescapable. People are terrible. They do terrible things. And while we know we're sinners, and it's not hard to convince people that they are sinners, what many people get wrong, though, is the problems sin causes. What is the direct consequence of our sin? See, for many, the problem with sin is that it causes all the problems we see around us. You know, all the pain and suffering, which is true, but it's only partly true. It misses the main point, the main problem. And it is very important to get at what the main consequence of sin is. Because if you mischaracterize a problem, you will come up with the wrong solution. To give you an example, if I fall and break my arm, this is something I am quite experienced with, and um, I may argue and say, I fell and my problem is my arm is in pain. And so all I need is a panado. Again, something, I, an argument I might actually make. But any of the doctors who are here will disagree with me. They will say, your problem is not pain. Your problem is that your bones are broken. They may need to be set into place. And what you're going to need is rest and healing. Painkillers are not enough to solve the problem. And the same is true with our spiritual fallenness. If we think the problem of our sin is all the social injustice we see around us, then we think the solution to sin is to fix all of the suffering we see around us. 
and you end up with the social gospel. Many churches fall prey to this sort of stuff. We advocate for human rights, push for social justice. You know, maybe what people need is to get countries with good constitutions and, and free and open democracies. Uh, many people advocate for this stuff. You know, get rid of corruption in government and the world will be utopia. But this will never work because it misses the point. Our problem is not that our sin puts enmity between one another. That, that is a consequence of sin, but it's further down the line. Our problem with sin is that it alienates us from God. In Colossians 1 verse 21, when Paul's writing to the church and to Christians, he speaks of us and says, we were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Our evil deeds have made us alienated and hostile in mind to God. Our sin makes us enemies of God. For the mind is set on the, that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. God and sinful life are at enmity with one another because God is holy. He's in direct opposition to sin. The psalmist says, for you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. Evil may not dwell with God. Sin and God are in opposition to one another. They don't exist in a harmonious relationship. In fact, those who sin sit under the wrath of God. As Nahum tells us, the Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. This is our problem. We have sinned and the Lord's wrath is reserved for us. It's not just an anger that oh, he'll get over it. His wrath is coming. It's ready to be poured out on sinners in judgment. We can't afford to be an enemy of God. We can't afford to be in the kingdom of darkness. This is the wrong alliance. We need peace, and we need peace with God. This is the gospel of peace. This is what Paul is talking about. Because Peace with one another won't solve this problem. Social programs and government reform is not going to stop the coming wrath of God. It may fix things temporarily for a while, but He is coming. He will judge the world. And so what we need is to be reconciled back to God. We need the peace that the gospel brings. God has wrath reserved for his enemies, okay? He's called all people to be holy just as he is holy. And we have sinned and broken his law. If we want peace, we need to satisfy two requirements. First, we need to satisfy his wrath. We have broken his law and his wrath is reserved for us. And second, we need to attain the righteousness and the holiness that God has called us to. And we're actually right back to where we started because we cannot do this. We are sinners. Sinners cannot attain this. But as you've heard in some of these testimonies earlier, God is a gracious God. He sent His eternal Son, Jesus Christ, the God-man, who came and became flesh. He lived among us. And He didn't just live among us. He perfectly fulfilled all the requirements of God's law. And he didn't do his own will, he did the will of his Father. He lived in obedience to the law of God, lived in obedience to the will of the Father. And in that obedience, he willingly went to the cross. He suffered and died in our place. He died as a substitute for us, a propitiation. That means the punishment that he got is what we deserved. He stood in our place and paid the price that we should be pray, paying. The wrath that was meant for us was poured out on Christ. But it doesn't just stop there because then the righteousness of Christ, all His fulfilling of the law, His active obedience to the will of the Father, His active obedience is given to us 
that we are then seen as obedient to God. This is what Christ was doing. For our sake, He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. And since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's Romans 5 verse 1 and 2 Corinthians 5. Um, I got those backwards though. But you see that there. We become the righteousness of God. Christ's work on the cross makes us good in the eyes of the Father because He sees Christ's obedience. And those who were baptized today, when they were going under with the washing of the water, this was a sign of that, of the remission of their sins, of their fellowship they now have with Christ in His death and His resurrection. And they are now proclaiming the peace that they have with God, the gospel of peace. This is why I always find baptismal services such a time of celebration. I look forward to them so much. It's a public profession of man having peace with God. And as an application, the first thing we'll look at is for those who may not have this peace. You know, maybe you've come and you're visiting today. You're still under the wrath of God. You think, actually, I can sort my problems out myself. My solutions will be fine. I'm here to tell you today that this is impossible. You cannot. Stop trying to deal with the symptoms. It's like taking a panado for falling out of an airplane. It's not going to work. You're still going to die. Stop trying to deal with the symptoms of your sin. You won't resolve it. The only way to fix this is to have peace with God. And like Paul does, in Corinthians, I implore you, be reconciled to God. Put your trust in Christ. Repent and believe the good news. Avoid the wrath to come. It is coming, so take hold of the gospel of peace. Be reconciled to God. Have peace with Him. And you will also attain all the benefits that come with this. And now let's look at one of these benefits, readiness. The text here doesn't tell us, put on the gospel of peace. It tells us, put on the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And so what does this word readiness mean? If some translations you have might translate it preparation. And doing a word study on this was actually quite hard because this word is not used anywhere else in the New Testament. Readiness is used, but it's a different word for readiness. But in most outside sources, like Josephus and a couple others, it's usually used as a term for readiness of mind or a prepared spirit, which fits into the context here. But it's also used in the Septuagint. That's a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And in the Septuagint, in places like in the book of Daniel, this word is actually used to translate the Hebrew word for foundation. And what we see is that when Paul uses a, a rare word like this, he's trying to borrow from, from both. He's speaking of a readiness, but a steadfast readiness, a readiness of spirit and mind that comes from the gospel of peace. It's an assured readiness. And this fits the sh metaphor for shoe as well very nicely, because Roman soldiers would have had their shoes studded with what they called hobnails, and this is so that they could gain a firm foothold. Wherever they were standing, they would be secure where they stood. They would have a firm foothold wherever they were marching. And you, you can imagine what a different studs make. I mean, I see quite a few happy people here, so I assume there are some who watched the rugby last night. But imagine if one team was allowed to wear togs and the other team had to, have barefoot, had to be barefoot. At scrum time, the guys without studs are getting pushed all over the place. They don't have the firm footing they need to do anything. And it'll be the same with us. We have our minds firmly planted in the gospel, secured in the peace that we know that we have with God because this was work done by Him. So we are ready to stand firm against whatever our enemy may bring. We're prepared 
And if you're practically minded, you may ask, well, how does the gospel prepare us for these attacks? Which is a legitimate question. You know, so if we look at the broader context, we can remember that Paul's warning Christians here of the prospect of satanic attack and calling on them to stand firm, to put on the whole armor of God. And so the readiness is a readiness to stand firm against satanic attacks. And just now when we're on that topic, satanic attacks is generally not what we see in movies like The Exorcist and Poltergeist. We don't read in the New Testament of demons making little girls walk on the roof like a spider or making their heads spin around 360 degrees. Okay, I'm also not discounting those kind of supernatural events. If you ever saw something like that, I'm pretty sure that it can only be achieved demonically. But what we see in Scripture generally is that Satan works by other means. He's called the accuser. He plants doubts in our minds. He spreads false teaching. This is what he did at the fall. He comes and he questions little things to Eve. Did God really say this? Is this like that? He accuses. He sows doubt. He causes us to ask things like, is Christ's sacrifice really enough? In the Ephesian church, this is in the book of Acts, when Paul speaks to them, he even warns them about this kind of stuff. He says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves may come in among you, not sparing the flock. See, this is generally how Satan operates. He brings wolves into the church. He sows doubt and discord. Not only in the New Testament, in in church history as well. This is why we have so many religions, so many offshoots from Christianity, false religions like Islam or cults like the Seventh-day Adventists and Mormonism. See, they all started by angels appearing to them and giving them a false gospel. This is no coincidence. This is how Satan operates. And we also see it with great men of God in church history. You know, many were ravaged with doubt and depression. Luther struggled with doubt throughout his life. Spurgeon had severe depression. And I have little doubt that this is satanic attack at play. These are great men of God, instrumental in the history of the church, being ravaged with these troubles. And so we need to ask, how did they withstand? How did they remain steadfast through all of this? It was the firm footing they had in the gospel of peace. Because in the gospel, we have absolute peace with God. We have assurance We're given a peace that surpasses all understanding, the Bible tells us. Because we have attained the righteousness of Christ, our sins have been forgiven, and we've contributed nothing to it. Not one iota. Jesus achieved this for us. He gave us the salvation. He is the only one that can undo it. We do not have the power to. Our feet are firmly on the rock of His work, of what He has done for us. And so we're able to withstand whatever the enemy hurls at us because of the peace that we have from God. Because of this peace, we're prepared. We need to arm ourselves with this preparation. This is Alexander McLaren, a Baptist minister, speaking on this passage. He says, For it is the gospel that brings the peace. And if its peace brings the preparedness, then the way to get the preparedness is by soaking our minds and hearts in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, and so maybe you're sitting here today, you have doubts, anxieties. Maybe you worry a lot, or you've got a tender conscience. You know, you read passages speaking of sinfulness, some of the things I mentioned earlier, and you just think, will God really even accept me? Am I strong enough to stand through the trials and temptations that are going to come my way? You know, I, I, I can't accomplish what these men of church history did. How, how will I withstand it if they struggled? But I'm here this morning to tell you that absolutely you can because of the gospel of peace. The men who went before us weren't superhuman people. They were rooted in the gospel given to us by God, by the creator of the universe. 
This is what gave them the strength to stand, the readiness to stand. Because Jesus accomplished it all. Jesus paid it all. There's no accusation Satan can bring against us. Everything has been done by Christ. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? And so when we firmly set our minds on the gospel of peace, we remind ourselves of this wonderful truth. And we will be ready. We will be armed. Because we will have the assurance that Christ has guaranteed in our salvation. This is how we get ready. We constantly remind ourselves of the gospel. Peter, speaking on a similar topic, said a a very similar thing. He said, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if these are things that you struggle with, you know, if the enemy is getting the better of you, remind yourselves of the peace you have in, with God. Remind yourselves of the truth of the gospel of peace. I got good advice the other day, and I think it's very helpful, so I'll share it. You can write verses, like Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, and faith alone, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Write things like this down. Stick it up around your home. Put reminders on your phone to remind you of these wonderful truths. Constantly reminding yourself of the readiness that it brings. Pray the Spirit of God will remind you of this. And do it every single day. Do it as much as you need to so that you can firmly stand with your feet shod with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And as we look at feet shod with shoes, let's look at our final point. What is meant by shoes? Because as we've already seen, the purpose that a Roman soldier had shoes was in part to give him a firm footing. But this wasn't the only purpose, or in fact, it wasn't even the main reason they had shoes. The main reason for a Roman soldier to have shoes was to allow him to move more easily. Mobility for a soldier in those days was key. When they were marching towards an enemy, they needed to get into position quickly or attack quickly. They needed to be able to move. The soldier's feet needed to be protected from the harsh terrain and also from traps. Uh, Soldiers often used to, um, or guerrillas, used to bury spikes in the ground to stop the advance of soldiers. But with their feet firmly protected, they're able to move quickly from A to B over all of these difficult things that may be in their way. And if you look at your concordance or if you read some commentators, not all, but some link it to other passages in Scripture as well. Because shoes of the gospel of peace sound somewhat familiar. And if you're familiar with your Bible, you'll immediately be thinking of the feet that bring good news, of Romans 10.15 or Isaiah 52.7. You know, a fuller quote of Isaiah says the following. It says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness. You see there, the proclamation of peace is in this bringing the good news. See, when we take the gospel out, we preach it to a perishing world. We're proclaiming peace. We're publishing peace. And in our fight against the schemes of the devil, we need to be armed with the readiness of this gospel. And part of that readiness is a readiness to go. The last order Christ gave to his church on his ministry here on earth, was to tell us to go, to take the gospel out, to preach to a world that has not heard it. And anybody can do this. You don't need to be a pastor or a professional evangelist to be ready to share the gospel of peace. Once you have been reconciled to God, you are qualified to share it with those around you. You have the good news which you believed. All you need to do is tell others the same news. You don't need to have a degree. The people hearing the gospel don't need to master some kind of special skill on how to live a better life before they become believers. They need to hear the good news, repent and believe, trust in the one who's died for their sins. 
So let me ask you, are you ready? Are you willing? Do you look for opportunities to share your faith in your place of work, in your day-to-day life? Or do you sit by idly, not mobile, not ready to go, not willing, letting the world perish and making yourself vulnerable to the enemy's attacks? Because let's not forget, this is the context of the passage here. Satan's attacks on Christians. We're talking about spiritual warfare and sharing the gospel is a significant part of spiritual warfare. It's not just Romans 10 and Isaiah 52 that just have this reference of feet and the gospel that link it together. We can look at passages like Luke chapter 10. Jesus sends out the 72 in this passage. He tells them, go and preach. Tell the world that the kingdom of God is at hand. And he says, bring a message of peace to every home that you enter. And what happened when the disciples returned? The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Satan fell at the proclamation of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, to engage in sharing the gospel, to engage in evangelism is an act of spiritual warfare, and it's an essential one. Listen to what John Calvin says about this passage in Luke. He says, our deliverance from the bondage of Satan is effected in no other way than through the gospel, and that those only make actual proficiency in the gospel in whom Satan loses his power so that sin is destroyed and they begin to live in the righteousness of God. And then later on he goes on to say, he commanded his gospel to be published for the very purpose of overturning Satan's kingdom. This is where the battle is fought, proclaiming the gospel of peace. And we need to be armed. We need to be ready for it. I'm not here calling everybody now to join the monthly evangelism. It would be nice, so please come along if you want to. But I am asking people to pray that the Lord would raise up workers ready for the ministry of gospel proclamation, as he does and commands us to do in Luke chapter 10. And I'm also telling you that you need to be willing and ready to share the gospel at any and every opportunity that arises. And the only thing that makes us ready is having the gospel of peace. Our readiness comes from the work of God. We only have confidence to preach this news because we've contributed nothing to our salvation. So arm yourselves with the readiness. Meditate on the truth of the gospel day in and day out. Do it so that you're ready to stand. Do it so that you're ready to withstand any doubts or accusations that may come your way. But also, meditate on the gospel so that you are ready to go. That you are ready to tell people about the good news we have in Christ. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is why we preach it to them. This is what will break people free from the bondage of Satan. And how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God in heaven, We thank you that you have reconciled us to you, to yourself, that we bring nothing to our salvation, and that not only does your gospel bring us peace with you, but in it we have the readiness to stand against the attacks of our enemy. We have the readiness to proclaim this good news to others that many more would believe, and we would continue to march onward to proclaim this truth until you return. We thank you that as we do this,
we are constantly reminded that you are with us always and to the end of the age. Amen.